chapter that is very interesting. I like the way they set the lesson up. They go through different uh, points that really seem to stand out to me. My name is Charles Riley. I'm the head elder here at the North Valley Seventh Avenue Church, and this is Denise. Yes, I'm the clerk in Roanoke, in our Seventh Avenue Church here in North Valley, at, in Roanoke, Virginia. It's a beautiful area, and we'd love for you to come visit sometime. And uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time on just saying hello. We'd like to get into our lesson. So without any further ado, uh, Denise, would you like to have our opening prayer? Yes. Father, <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so much for this glorious, sunshiny Sabbath day. I pray that you bless all of the Sabbath keepers all over the world and those who've tuned in to find out what Sabbath is about, that they would really receive an incredible blessing and understanding. Thank you so much for hearing this prayer and help us to listen with our ears so that we don't miss anything this morning about dealing with difficult passages in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Exactly. We are dealing today with difficult passages. I think anybody that's ever picked up a Bible and started even just casually reading through it, you're going to run into verses that either don't make any sense or they seem to be totally incorrect or something that totally is different than what you might believe already. So what do you do with those? How do you handle them? Do you just write them off? Do you ignore them? Uh, is it, I know I've got a few that I've had to say, well... Someday I'll, you know, find an answer out to that one. But, um, and so a couple of them I say, well, I'm just going to have to take that on faith, you know, until I get some more information. So it really depends on what verse you're looking at and how serious you really are about finding out its meaning. You know, I think a lot of us today, we like everything so instantaneous. Mm-hmm. And get impatient. Yeah. Yeah. I remember hearing this gentleman on, a, I think he was on a TV show, and he, was, he thought it was comical that here we are in such a wonderful age. Look at, we can fly through the air in airplanes and be on the other side of the world in a few hours, and all the things we can do and that we have access to. And he said, nobody's happy. You know, if we turn on our computer and it takes 10 seconds to boot up, too we're busy, upset. Too busy scurrying. Yes. <laughs> So we had a to and fro as the Bible calls it. We had a passage we don't understand. We like, hmm, I don't understand that, and move on. Go to something else. But I think what the Lord wants us to do is sit down with it and actually take a serious look at these passages, try to understand them, try to figure them out, and that's what our lesson's about today. How you go about doing that. And the first thing I do is nowadays I put on my reading glasses so that I can do that. Um, Denise, would you like to read our memory verse? And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord's salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, or us, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which on taught and on stable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. To me, that's saying that they, they don't understand it. They come up with an interpretation and then make an assumption for other parts of the Bible. And I think that you need to pray earnestly to say, Lord, I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to me. Would you please bless me with your Holy Spirit so that I can understand it? And, and give me patience to wait for the understanding because he doesn't always give it to you today. That's exactly right. In fact... Um I used to keep a log. Probably need to get back into it. I used to keep a log of uh, if I ran across a scripture or something that didn't make any sense to me or seemed to be incorrect or something. I'd write it down. And a lot of times I'd check it with other versions, see how they uh, translated that, that section of scripture. And sometimes it might take a year or two before I, I got an answer. And so you never know. Um, sometimes it took a lot of really hard study. But sometimes the pastor will bring it out in the sermon for you. Exactly. And, you're, and the Holy Spirit says, see, here's the answer, Denise, or whoever he's talking to. But when you're dealing with difficult passages, uh, just like anything else that you 
basically doing research on. Um, one of the things I put down on the head of my lesson, see I wrote all over it, um, I, I put down on there what this is really dealing with this week is how good a detective are we? You know? Yeah. Are we a good That's detective? A good <laughs> if we find something we don't understand, are we really digging into it like they do at a crime scene to find out what happened? Or, I thought, you know, there's a lot of words that could be used instead of detective. How about a prospector? You know, we, we talk about those rich mines of information in the Bible, but you've got to dig for it sometimes. In fact, I think the lesson brings that out. How about an explorer? Did you ever think of that you're exploring basically the history of the world when you pick up a Bible? You know, we can understand exploring a yeah, new continent. Yeah, that's a very good way to put that. Yeah. You know that my favorite what? history was world history and Christian church history? I liked them both because they fit together. Yes. I thought it was very fascinating. I wanted to know my roots as a Christian. And I thought it was always interesting. When I was in school, I didn't like history. I didn't like the way they taught it. Hated it. I got tired of it. All the <laughs> dates over and, and over. <laughs> names I couldn't pronounce and places I'd never heard of. But when I got into studying historical things that I was interested in, yep. that was a whole different story. Okay. And like you go back and study wars, like maybe the Napoleon Wars or something like that, and the strategies and how one side actually won the battle when they were really should have lost the battle. Yet yeah. they ended up winning. Well, it, an example of that is um, the Civil War. Actually, the Union or the um, South Confederate side was actually supposed to win, but the angels intervened and said, no, slavery is going to be over with. So there's a lot of things you can look at. Um, when you're studying the Bible, you're basically becoming an archaeologist, you know, because that's the Bible is one of the main things they use to go find all the sites that they're wanting to study into. And you're a researcher, of course. But let's get into this a little bit because I like the way this is set up. Um, I did want to touch um, on the fact that on the first page here, it, it brings out we're not going to be this week looking into the passages that might be uh, difficult to understand, but rather we're looking at the way in which you might be able to understand them better. And so we're looking more at the logistics of how you would go about researching and exploring the Bible to get answers to the difficult passages rather than studying like a sampling of them themselves. If, I'm sure all of you know of a passage or two that has always been kind of a question mark in your mind. So maybe this lesson today will help you to be able to resolve it and study further into it and get the answers you're looking for. Uh, if we go to Sunday's lesson, it talks about possible reasons for apparent contradictions. And in this part of it, uh, again, it's dealing, a lot of our contradictions seem to come from our good Apostle Paul. Um, I think his mind worked in such a higher level than mine. Uh, I've read a lot of his, well, most of the New Testament's Paul's writings. But he might start off in one spot on a thought, and it might go through a, a chapter or two before he finishes it. I mean, when you run into a passage that's hard to understand or it looks like a contradiction, you don't just have to back up a few verses. You might have to back up a few chapters and try to, try to get it all. Well, what's he talking about here? What's he trying to say? Because he would just keep going. His mind would go so deep and so into yeah. stuff. And then we come along trying to read it after being translated through a you few can, different languages. You just read two or three verses. You need to read all of it. Exactly. And you yeah, get lost. Yeah. I get lost in it. I'll be halfway through, and I forget what he started out with. <laughs> and then he'll come back to it, and I'm like, well, what's, what's that got to do with this? So you can come up with some apparent contradictions, but I think if you really study into it, and in our own life. And you should mark your Bible. Mark your Bible. Give it, write yourself information so that you know what connects with I've got an old Bible I've got an old Bible that um, I marked up a long time ago I found a good passage I'd underline it highlight it put a star beside it or something and it's really good to go pick that Bible up now 
20, 30 years later, and you'll be flipping through and you'll see something lit up, and you'll read it and you'll say, wow, I don't ever remember reading that before. <laughs> but I marked it. You know, I have marked the thing, but don't remember reading it. Don't remember knowing about it before. Hmm. So it's like a complete refreshment of my mind. And I thought, that's neat. That's pretty cool. It shows you how good my mind is. It forgets a lot. So, but um, what do we do with what looks like a contradiction, Denise? Well, the best thing to do is to study to show yourself approved unto God. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, um, 15, I believe it is. One of the things we've got to realize is, go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I just wanted to make sure I get the right text. A workman, it says a workman need, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then it also says to shun profane and vain babblings. And to me that's saying that people who just come up with ideas and aren't really searching their Bible, don't, don't put that in your catalog. Dismiss it. Study for yourself. And I remember that the Bereans, they studied every day to make sure that whatever Peter or, or was it Peter? Paul. Paul, I'm sorry. Paul was telling them was true. So they studied for themselves. So when you hear the pastor or the bishop or whomever it might be preaching, you need to have your Bible open, maybe write yourself notes. And when you get home, you need to figure out, okay, so is this really in the Bible? Especially if they're not using a Bible in front of them, they're not actually giving you text. You need to find the information to find out what the Bible says about that subject. And you can do that with a concordance too. Have you ever had anybody come and say, well, I don't bother reading the Bible anymore because it's so full of contradictions. How do you answer that? I had someone do that to me years ago, and it kind of caught me off guard, and I thought, well, I know there are some things that seem like they are contradictory, but if you study them out, you realize just, just like in our society today, um, we're at a big thing of being equal right now. Well, is there ever a time when the exact same circumstances occur, conditions. exact yeah. same conditions are in place, and everything can be done exactly the same. I don't know that there is. I don't know that any two people are the same. That's why I think when you see, um, like with a judge, he might give one person uh, a sentence of two years, another person three. Or he might do something differently. I think a lot of it has to be taken into consideration. We can't just take a, a surface view of stuff yeah. and just make a blanket statement that this way everything should be done. Well, it's like with children. We know the personalities you know, of our own children, and we don't always have the same discipline for each child because one discipline might work for one child, but it might not work for another. Or one motivation might work for one child, but it certainly might not work for the other. You know, some Absolutely. Like parent, and some like um, a challenge. You know, or maybe that's not a good example, but... Anyway, we're, we're each one unique, and God appreciates that too. So when there, people think there's contradictions in the Bible, or you yourself or myself, we need to go, you know, see if, if we can find other areas in the Bible that it talks about it, and think and look, read the whole passage, maybe two or three chapters, to find out what those conditions are to see how that matches up, and we'll find that, well, obviously this condition occurred, so this is what needed to take place. That's true. And I think another important point on reading the Bible is you're probably going <laughs> to... I need water. You're probably going to get out of the Bible what you look for to get, at, to get out of it. If you have a proper mindset that you're going to go in and really learn something and, and be blessed by it and you're looking for the Lord to open your eyes and give you some instruction... I think you'll really have a good time and you'll really gain a lot. But if you go in with this critical attitude and um, basically not believing it and expecting it to be full of contradictions, I think you can find those too. One of the best examples of that is, I don't know where I heard this from, but I thought it was a great analogy. Two people walked into a rose garden and the one person was just, it just, elated, and they were so beautiful and enjoyed the roses. And they made the comment, I am so happy 
that God would put these beautiful flowers on thorn bushes. Okay? And the other person that walked into the rose garden was griping and grumbling and didn't like any of it. And he was just so upset because God put thorns on such beautiful flowers. Well, his focus was wrong. Yes, because he was the missing thorns it. didn't come from God. <laughs> Whatever. But, yeah. but you've got the idea <laughs> that sin problem. one is focused on the beautiful flowers and the other one's focused on the thorns and, and grumbling about it. We can do the same thing today in our life. How is your focus? How, is, how are you taking all the problems in this world that you can get caught up in, yeah. all this, especially right now, there's so many things, so much rebellion, so much stuff that Confusion. people are upset about and angry mm -hmm. and protesting and everything. And you can destroy your life yeah. being focused on, being on, on everything negative all, all the time. Does I'm saying that we shouldn't stand up for anything? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. There are things that we have the uh, right to protest and to disagree and to request changes, and there's a way to do that. Uh, I'm not a rioter. Uh, I don't think we should be destroying stuff. I think it hurts our cause. But I can understand people being angry, and I can understand wanting to make changes. And I think one of the things the Bible does, if nothing else, God is a great one that changes everybody. If you want to see change and stuff, God is the one that will certainly do that for you. Thanks, Deb. Appreciate that. So. She's got good ears. Or intuition. She's a servant. She's just, just good. <laughs> so your attitude and going in can make all the difference in the world. And I want to read this last uh, Sentence down on the bottom of uh, well, my book, it's page 97. It says, All the mistakes will not cause trouble to one's soul or cause any feet to stumble. That would, not, that would not manufacture difficulties from the plainest revealed truths. In other words, if you find something that looks like a mistake or that looks like a little bit of a, you don't understand it at the moment, don't throw out all the rest of the Bible. I've read many books from various authors, and there might be a few things in the book I disagree with, but the vast majority of the book might be really good information. I'm not going to throw all of it out because of one or two things that I disagree with. The Lord says weigh the, um, how's it put, weigh, weigh the fruits, you know, weigh them, find out. I wanted to mention something, too. It's, it's the same with people. Um, well, maybe not the same, but it, it's an, you could probably gain something from this thought. You know, you meet people, and they have, have a good aura about them, and they're very serious about doing right. Just because they make one mistake, you shouldn't just dump them as a person, should you? Well, that's, and that maybe that's not a really good analogy, but... The other thing I wanted to mention, it says here, and I know this is true, we, we meet people all the time, you know, if you've been around for a long time, you realize that everybody has a different level of knowledge that they have acquired, okay? So no person has a comprehensive knowledge of every area of learning. And that's something that I tell my, um, when I was working with students, I told them that all the time. I'd say, you know, because they say, well, I don't think that's important. I, I didn't want to put that on my resume. Well. I have to explain to them, or they say, well, you know, it's easier for this person to get a job because they have, they have this degree. I said, but you need to remember that we have to have waiters, we have to have tech people, we have to have desk people, we have to have people who um, do cleaning. Everyone is extremely important in their field, even if there is different levels of pay for each field. That isn't something one should pay attention to. Each person should know that whatever you're doing is extremely important. And so you wouldn't want to dismiss a person because they didn't have as much learning as you have, and you wouldn't want to be dismissed if you didn't have as much learning as they have. And so you have to remember the value of a person. Jesus died for everyone in the world. Okay. And so it's really important to him. Is that for me? I think that mic may be for you. Yours must not be working right. Well, if you go into Monday's lesson, it's dealing with uh, honesty 
and being careful. Are you an honest person? Am I an honest person? You know, when you run into difficult verses, they need to be diligently studied out. But if you're not honest with yourself, you're going to run into problems with that. And I like this one thing down here. It says, honesty safeguards us so that we do not evade any difficulties or try to obscure them. Honesty will also restrain us from giving superficial answers that do not really bear the test of scrutiny. God is pleased with honesty and integrity. Therefore, we should emulate his character in all that we do, even in our study of the Bible. I think this is a good point that we can apply to a lot of different things because, you know, God does understand our, our life here. He understands the things we go through. And he understands that when we run into difficulties and get discouraged and get upset, he understands that. And he understands that if we are honest in our questioning of him or his government or the way he does things, he understands that. He will answer us. Um, he may do it in his own way, in his own time, but I don't think he holds that against us because if he knows that we're honest about it. Another thing that's good down here, it says honest people will deal with Bible difficulties in such a way that are careful not to prevent information or present information out of context, distorted, and with the truth um, loaded language or mislead others. In other words, we're not going to be manipulating the evidence. If you're honest in what you're studying, you're not going to be trying to twist it or make it say something that it's really not trying to say. And I think that's, that's kind of common. You know, I've, I've studied with other people and, and every now and then you run into things where they, they'll take a simple verse and try to make it say something that just doesn't fit. It doesn't gel. doesn't gel at all. And you say, well, where did you get that from? It's, that's not anything to do with this. But they're just totally sold on it and believe that's, what it, that's the way it should be taken. One thing about being careful is to make sure that you're not making errors your, yourself. Uh, one of the things that the, when they were transcribing the Bible back in the old days to make new copies, they had a system whereby they checked each page and made sure that there were no errors. So your scribes had to be extremely careful that they put everything down the way it was supposed to be. Well, you mentioned to me back a few weeks ago. Is that on? We're having a few technical difficulties today. Okay, that that's sounds better. better. Sounds a lot better. Right. You mentioned a few weeks ago, Charlie, something to Deb and I that I thought was e extremely interesting about, the, was it the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found? Yes. Can you share that again? Well, um, it was, I'd had um, a professor, I'd asked him, he was a head of the religious department, and I asked him, because um, he said he held everything equal. The writings of the Bible were equal with all the other sacred writings. And I asked him, I said, well, what about the prophecies? But explain about sacred writings. Well, you have all your different writings, like you have the Bible, you have the Koran, yeah. and a lot of your different, all your different religions okay. have scriptures. That's what I wanted you to mention. Okay. okay. And so what he was saying was he held everything equal. And so I asked him, I said, well, what do you do in the Bible with the prophecies where the book was written maybe uh, a thousand years before what was prophesied occurred? And... His comment was, well, you got to understand, those prophecies were all written after the fact. It wasn't actually a prophecy. It was they copied it down after it happened and wrote it up like it was a prophecy. But I remember when they brought, um, I saw a thing where they'd, they had interpreted the Dead Sea Scrolls and they found the entire book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written long, long before the birth of Christ. Yes. And he is one of the main prophets that told what Christ was going to be doing. Well, and Isaiah was dead before Jesus came. <laughs> well, the so Dead Sea. Obviously. <laughs> and the Dead Sea Scrolls were written way <laughs> before Jesus. Yes. And so his answer really didn't hold water. Yep. But, yeah, you know, it depends on what you want to accept. 
I've I've known people that would things that they knew, and and here's a here's a good point I think we could make right now. There's a difference between what you know and what you believe. Yeah. I know that this is my phone, and it's got my Bible in it, and I know that this is a cup of water. But I might believe that this table is purple. Okay. My belief doesn't necessarily have to be centered on facts. Yeah. Beliefs can be about anything. And beliefs can be based on faith. I believe that one day Jesus is going to return. Amen. What fact do I have other than Scripture yes. to base that on? I can't walk out and see him coming. So to say that Jesus will return someday is not based on what I can actually physically see. But this I can see. But we have with that faith about Jesus coming the second time is we've got this entire Bible and all of the facts that already occurred to support that belief. We have something that the disciples didn't have, but they had him in front of them. They had the Old Testament. We have the Old and the New Testament. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the Christian archaeologists out there. We really appreciate your devotion to Christian history and to what Jesus has done for us. Well, actually, all archaeologists. Um, yes. They don't even have to be Christian. They've, they've gone out and dug up many sites. Yes. Um, you know, Solomon's... Different uh, cities. Huh? Yes, Solomon's stables and things like that. Yes, thank so, you to all the archaeologists yes. who like to find out all these cool things. Another thing that we need to do when we start studying on difficult verses is we need to approach it humbly. Have you ever had someone that was arrogant yeah. or just full of themselves and try to talk to them or reason with them about something, if it doesn't totally match up exactly with what they already believe... They're just not listening. They are not. And I think that's one of the problems uh, when you talk about being open-minded or closed-minded. If you are a person that is opinionated and very arrogant, or kind of think a little too highly of yourself, you're probably pretty close-minded. Yeah. And you might look at things and you want them all to line up a certain way. And I don't think you're going to be totally honest in that area when you start lining them up because of your prejudice that you already have. And so that's one of the things I thought was a really good point, that when you go to study something, put, put all this stuff out of your mind. Look for something new. Don't bring in all your uh, cultivated ideas that you've carried maybe for all your life. But allow the Lord to open your mind to some new thoughts every now and then. And, uh, and here it talks about, um, I put down, this, I didn't, uh, on these verses for the read, one thing I wrote under them was, uh, because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And I thought to myself, that's a perfect text where yes, yes. It's, a, it's a promise. Yes, yes, it is. I want the grace. I want to mention the other verse. Um, <clears throat> Humble yourself on the side of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's a song. I know there's got to be a lot of people out there that know that song. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention it. He will lift you up. Uh, on, the, on the text here, it says, Many people have come to the amazing realization and humbling insight that they are dependent upon something and someone, and the, it says, outside of themselves. Um, I, I change that to other than themselves, because I like to think of the Holy Spirit being inside of us, not outside of us. But okay. that's just me. That's my mind. But, you know, sometimes you can run into uh, situations where you cannot resolve it. It could be in studying the Bible. It could be something at work. I am a firm believer if, if you have a question about something, go ask somebody else. Um, yes. Unless you do it too much. You've know, you got you to kind of tailor that sometimes. But if you're really in the dark on something, get some expert advice. I am constantly going to Google and asking for things. And in fact, I even Googled. Um, I'm doing the sermon after this. And I Googled... Uh, what is a sermon? I looked it up. I got the Google definition. I'll give it to you later. But 
I thought it was interesting that um, ask a question. Don't be so full of yourself that you think you know everything already. Yeah. The only one that knows everything already is God. You know, and I don't think we're, we're there told yet. That we're going to keep learning when our minds become perfect at the glorification when we go to heaven. So that won't that be exciting? We're using maybe what three to five percent of our brain. What's in the rest of it? We need to use it. I like this part about the benefits of humility and thinking are manifold. The habit of hu humble inquiry is the foundation of all growth in knowledge, for it generates a freedom that naturally produces a teachable spirit. This doesn't mean that humble people are often necessarily wrong or that they will always change their minds and will never have a firm conviction. It means only that they are submissive to biblical truth. And I know there's people out there because I've met them that in the morning, that's the one thing they pray. Dear Lord, please make me humble and teachable. Yes. I think it's a wonderful prayer. And I liked uh, what was brought out in the next paragraph. If you don't mind, I'm just going to read in. <clears throat> it says, All who will come to the word of God for guidance with humble inquiring minds determined to know the terms of salvation, will understand what saith the scripture. But, and I'd like to emphasize this a little bit, because I think in the last few decades, um, our churches have kind of gotten away from letting people know that there's not only a heaven to gain, but there's a hell that we need to avoid. To shun. Yes. And so this next verse says, but... Those who bring to the investigation, the w bring to the investigation of the word, a spirit which does not approve. With, let me start this again. See if I can remember how to read here. But those who bring to the investigation of the word a spirit which it does not. If you bring to the investigation of the word of God a spirit which it does not approve, you will take away from the search a spirit which the word of God has not imparted. Yeah, that, that's something to be feared, to be avoiding. The sentence is kind of rough for me to read, <laughs> but I wanted to think about that for a second. We all know that if you pick up your Bible and ask the Lord to guide you, his angels draw near, his Holy Spirit yeah. will guide you in it. We have faith to believe that. This is saying, but... If you come in with the wrong spirit to criticize the Bible, to pick it apart, to find things to object to it, you're going to leave with the wrong spirit. And God tells us not, not to try to explain that to people. It says here that the Lord will not speak to a mind that's not concerned. He wastes not his instruction on one who was willingly irreverent or polluted. And so... Um, we need to remember that when we're talking to people and they seem like they're interested in the Bible, but as soon as something's mentioned to them, they immediately th start throwing darts. I think I'd start praying and let God finish that conversation. Right, and we got to realize everybody's at a different level. Um, Absolutely. I've, I can remember conversations I had with people that at the time were more spiritual than I was, and... Yes. I rejected what they were saying, yeah. and they couldn't make me understand. It's too hard-headed. And so they pretty much had to, you know, we just kind of agreed to disagree. And then later on, I realized they were right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, were, they were giving me some good information. I, I was rejecting it. And, um, but here's the thing I think Probably we need to... Probably happens to all of us. Yes. Now, it also says on here that, um, you know, if you believe in God, you have to believe in Satan. God talks too much about Satan and what he's doing. But here's some of the stuff that Satan is doing. He says, but the tempter educates every mind that yields itself to his suggestions and is willing to make of none effect God's holy law. In other words, if you have the wrong attitude, Satan loves it. He would love to put his ideas into your mind and have you um, educated in the way he thinks. And totally disregard God. And I think that's what happened with Peter. When he rebuked Jesus. Jesus wasn't saying what Peter wanted to hear. He thought Jesus was ready to set up the kingdom. And he was going to be some big important person. Like all the disciples thought. And when Jesus said no I'm going to go to the cross and die. And, 
and all that, Peter rebuked him. And Christ immediately rebuked Peter and Satan at the same time. Another thing we need if we're going to study the Bible is determination and patience. You know, I've heard you all my life, anything worth having is worth working for. Amen to that. Have you ever known people that gave up too soon? Yeah. In life even in so, itself. <laughs> I'm going to tell a story on my son, my oldest son, Charlie Arnold. I remember when he was in grade school, he was doing poorly in this one class. And so uh, I went with him. I was going to have to talk with the teacher with him, see what we could do to where the problem was. See we could, it was right at the end of school. He needed to do something like really quick. And I remember that. <laughs> and he went and he, one of the things he asked the teacher was, what's the least I can do and still pass this class? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I thought to myself, the teacher. <laughs> that's, you don't ask a teacher that. You say, <laughs> what's the least I can do? I thought, oh, no. This <laughs> Start off on the wrong foot. <laughs> yes, wrong, wrong, wrong. And I, I remember she looked at me and says, just do your homework. <laughs> you know, he, he so was, if he did his homework, she was going to give him a C. Uh, maybe a D, but I, I don't oh. think... I don't think he's anywhere near a C. Okay. But I thought it was so funny that he wasn't, he wouldn't have any determination. He was wanting to do just enough to get by. And I thought, if that's the way you live your life, you're in big trouble. Yeah, because all you're going to get to pass by you is the leftovers. <laughs> that's right. And I, I, I try to tell everybody, especially my Christian friends, look, set your goals high in the Lord. The 144,000 at the end of time, as far as I know, is the pinnacle of the highest thing you could attain to in the Christian life. Set your goal there. I want to be one of the 144,000. And then, you know, if you aren't as diligent and as persevering and patient as you should be, and you don't become one of the 144,000, at least you may have excelled in other areas. And I think your calling and election would still be pretty sure. But if you set your goal as to do the least I can do to get saved, I think that's pretty dangerous because all of us seem to fall short of what we actually want to do. Kind of like New Year's resolutions. They're usually pretty much over and done with by the end of January for most people. So all of us, if we'd set our goals high, we might have a better outcome than if we set them really low. And in this thing, it talks about um, real achievement always requires tenacity you all know what tenacity is what's tenacity denise for me it's a tackling with everything i've got even if i think somebody's going to stop me and hanging on <laughs> for dear life sometimes. and never say die and just go for it sometimes i make a bunch of blunders on the way because i'm in such a hurry to get it done <laughs> that's true i wanted to mention a verse to for encouragement about sometimes we don't know as much as we need to know, and we, we need to know about trust. So in Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12 and 13, I want to read that to you quickly. For I, okay, Jeremiah 29, 11, 12, and 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end, meaning heaven, eternal life. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. That doesn't mean just reading and studying the Bible. It means praying diligently. And when you get that trust, you start sharing it with other people and saying, hey, I trust God. He's got all these promises. And when I have problems or Things are really exciting. I share them with God because he's my best friend. That's what you want. You want him to be your best friend. Exactly. Very good point. And he, his ways are higher than mine. Yep. Now, our lesson doesn't really get into this a bit. But, you know, how do you go about, and it might do in the next lesson. I haven't read it yet. Uh, one of the things I used to use extensively was a concordance and Bible dictionaries because sometimes some of the words lose something in the translation. Like if you go into Genesis where God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, nowadays that means to redo something. If I, 
if I drink this glass of water and I want it replenished, I go fill it up again. But Adam and Eve were to actually fill the earth, not refill it. And so if you get into the dictionaries and stuff and look at some of the uh, way things are translated and, and the concordances where you can find other scriptures, that can really do some unlocking of, of passages. I used to love to do word studies. Take a word and see where all it appears in the Bible. Uh, like the word, I remember I did a study on we, wine. We did that in, uh, yeah. at Southern College. Back Absolutely. In yeah, we did that. And it was fun. It was like a, it was yeah. like a treasure hunt or a yeah. scavenger hunt. And uh, I, I remember doing one on wine. Our Bible translates to King James wine. We get back into the original v- versions, uh, uh, languages. They had several different words for wine. One word meant fresh grape juice. One meant slightly fermented because they put them in the wine sacks. They fermented enough to keep them from spoiling. Some of them uh, meant a really hard liquor. They, they mixed wines together like a sangria, and some of them they added opiates to it. I mean, it was some strong drink. When the Bible talks about strong drink, they had some strong drink back then. And so yeah. I was mainly concerned with, you know, what kind of wine did Jesus deal with? What kind of wine did he make at the feast? What kind of wine did they offer him at the cross? Things like that. So... That was something I did, and I used extensively the concordance and Bible dictionaries to find out what I was really looking we at. studied that, too. And it really opened up a lot. I encourage you to do that the same. Uh, determination and patience. Each of us has to decide how much time and energy we're going to put in to studying maybe a controversial verse, something we don't understand. And there may be, um, like I say, you go back again to your attitude when you start studying it. If you feel like you're just going to jump in and jump out real quick or uh, if you don't get the the problem answered immediately, you just write it off and go on to something else, um, you're probably not going to really uncover a lot. But it's those that really dig into it. And I had a book one time. It was called, uh, bought it at the Christian bookstore, Heaven's Bookstore. It was called Spirits in His Parlor about the uh, experience of a gentleman in Hawaii. His mother was a witch doctor. And he tells growing up being involved with all this voodoo and stuff that they did over there. And then he talked about how he found Christianity. And he had a group of about 20 some people that would get together at his house. And they were studying through the Bible, trying to find out the truths, the the doctrines. And when they would come to something they didn't understand, they would all search through the whole Bible and find out all they could on it. And he said a lot of times they would come to a block wall. They just, they'd have everything laid out, they'd studied it all, and they still didn't know what the conclusion should be. One of the things they were studying out was when does the Sabbath begin and end? They found the Sabbath on their own. Cool. And That's wonderful. they were trying to figure out when it started and when it ended. And they studied and studied and just couldn't get it. And they would then stop and pray until God gave them an answer. And this gentleman, I can't, his name was this long. I can't begin to pronounce it. But, <laughs> but he they prayed. That's the key. While they were in prayer, he said that a man in white would come to him and give him the answer. And the man in white came and told him from sundown to sundown, that's the Sabbath. And he gave him some information on other things. But they stayed with it and kept studying and praying till they got an answer. Amen. And I thought, you know, all of our blockbuster movies usually deal with some big hero, some big uh, magic or extra powers or aliens or something. We've got so much stuff in our Bibles, so many things that yes. we don't expect to have something like that happen. And I think it's one of the reasons it may not happen. What if you expected God to actually give you an answer after you finish studying all that you could study. What if he didn't want to wait a year or so and have somebody else answer it for you? What if he really wanted to give it to you right then? But we quit and give up and, you know, write it off and say, well, I'll I'll set this aside for now and wait for God to answer me. What if we did like this Hawaiian gentleman and kept praying like Daniel? When Daniel wanted to answer his prayer, he kept praying every day. He kept bugging God. I don't understand this, Lord. Please show me what's the, what is this? Wouldn't he go like 23 days 
before Gabriel was got to him? Some long yeah, time. It was, it was a long time. But da Daniel did not give up. As our busy lives and our, our way of lifestyle gotten us to where we aren't willing to be that patient, we aren't willing to, to bring our petitions to the throne that we give up too soon and quit and don't get the answers God might be wanting to give us. I'm talking to myself. <laughs> you know, yes. this is the kind of stuff I need to think about. Well, it mentions here to those of us who are able to get on your knees, but if you can't get on your knees, you can still pray in a chair and bow your head. It's the same principle. But when you bowed your head and humbled yourself before the Lord in prayer, things change. It says, it has been said that on our knees, we literally look at difficulties from a new perspective. For in prayer, we signal that we are in need of divine help in interpreting and understanding scripture. In prayer, we seek the illumination of our minds through the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible writers to write what they wrote. And, there, and those of you who have prayed understand that humbleness that comes to you when you realize that you're definitely in need of spiritual help from above. You don't have it, and only God has it. So you're asking him. Now, at the bottom of the page, it asks a question, well, a couple questions. I'm going to hit the second one. How can we encourage others not to give up their search for truth? Well, I guess it's the second question. And I put under there, tell them an experience you've had. All of us, if we've been in the church any time at all, should have some experience with the scriptures and with the Lord that we could share with somebody that's becoming discouraged. And if you can do that, you might turn somebody from maybe walking away from scripture altogether and losing their salvation. And it means so much because they can see you and reach out and touch you. And I think, I think a uh, personal experience carries a lot more weight than some theory or yes. some cliche. We're, we're quick to do that, but I think a real experience does more. And then we get into, the, uh, on Thursday, deal with difficulties scripturally and prayerfully. I'll We've hit prayerfully. Head. We've already hit prayerfully a little bit. But think about it. What's the best interpreter of the Bible? The Bible itself. Here a little, there a little. Put it all together, you get a good conclusion. And it says on here, the best solution to Bible difficulties is still found in the Bible itself. Learning to mine the great truths found in Scripture is one of the most important things we can do. Did you know that, Denise? Yes. Did you know that studying the Bible is one of the most important yes. things you could do? It gives you great comfort. It gives you peace of mind. It, it gives you um, confidence you know, in God. Yes. That's what it does for me. And it gives you the knowledge you need. Yeah, it's very interesting. We don't have all the truths yet. I mentioned one of the stories in the Bible to my daughter. She said, wow, that's kind of rated, isn't it? She, she didn't say dated. She said rated. Rated? <laughs> because, yes, because I said, did you know this happened? Because I knew that she would find it interesting. And it had to do with um, um, one of the stories where... Um, one of the J kings, I can't remember his name now, but I read it recently. Yeah, they were pretty rough. Had, you know, 31 sons beheaded because they, that was, unfortunately, that was what kings did. Yeah. But they were all wicked, and, you know, and so they, you know, he got rid of those wicked ones. I understand that Alexander the Great, when he took the throne from his, because his father passed away, he had all of his relatives executed, eliminated anybody that, would try to lay claim to the throne. He yeah. took it. And yeah. took, that they was, take it very seriously. That was pretty common. In fact, it was common in several of uh, the uh, dynasty with Israel also. One thing I want to read on here is... Um, the Bible is very interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've already touched on prayer a little bit. It says, in prayer, our motives are laid open. And we can tell God why we want yeah. to understand what we read. In prayer... We ask God to open our eyes to his word and to give us a willing spirit to follow and practice his truth. This is crucial. God doesn't want you just studying something to have head knowledge. 
He wants you to study his word so you can put it into practice. Make it a part of, his, of your life so that when he comes, you'll already be ready for heaven. Right? Yes, and I've found that when I have something that's really important to me and I pray about it on a regular basis, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit shows me the error in my prayer. Sometimes we pray selfishly and we don't even know we're doing it. We think we have the right motive in mind. But then as we keep praying about it, the Holy Spirit educates us and says, no, you don't need to ask about this. Tell God you have a situation and let him worry about it. Let go of the worry. I had an uncle told me once that he was kind of a rough guy. And uh, he decided to kneel down one night and ask for forgiveness for some stuff he'd done. And as he was praying to God to forgive him, in the back of his mind, he was thinking of how he was going to do it again. And he says, I just got up off my knees. <laughs> he just gave up because it wasn't something he really wanted to do. He was oh, enjoying yeah. what he was doing. Scary. Yeah. yeah, but this is humanity. Yes, the and devil has a real hold on people, mate. They don't realize the peace they can have. And we're getting close to close. Let's, let's close with this part here that ties in with what you just said. When the word of God is open without reverence and without prayer, when the thoughts and affections are not fixed upon God or in harmony with his will, the mind is clouded with doubts. And in the very study of the Bible, skepticism strengthens. The enemy takes control of the thoughts, and he suggests interpretations that are not correct. This is very dangerous. This is something that we need to be very careful of. Yes, you may be studying your Bible. Yes, you may be reading it. But make sure you're doing it with the right attitude. I keep going back to attitude in life, and I keep thinking everything seems to be so critical based on your attitude. If your attitude is right, most of the time your actions will be perfect, be what they need to be. But if you have a bad attitude and are trying to do things the wrong way, your life is going to be miserable. Let's all study the Bible with a true purpose to get to know God better, to live a better life, and to be ready to meet Him when He comes. Why don't we all bow our heads for prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we indeed thank you for this study today. Thank you for giving us some good insights in how to resolve problem texts. And now help us to go back to our Bibles, look up the texts that we had questions about, and apply what we've gone over today. And Lord, as we clear our minds of our prejudices, as we open our minds to you and to your, your guidance and your spirit, we ask that you'd block all of Satan's influence, that you would surround us with your angels, and that you would help us to grow and become more knowledgeable of you. And Lord, when we have the opportunity, help us always be ready to encourage somebody else and point them in the right direction. For in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen.